Did you know that 80% of the sales for the cannabis market in California is still from illegal sales? Hey, what's going on everybody? Mike Moreno here with Much More Media. Happy to join you today. And today's video conversation is going to be around uh, my takeaways from a cannabis conference that I just came back from in Oakland, California. And this conference was thrown by uh, Bolton and Company. It was what they called their Cannabis Summit uh, for 2019. It was up in Oakland, California, and it had two different panels on it. Uh, the first panel in the morning was based around banking and insurance and uh, you know mergers and acquisitions and accounting and those types of things, really um, the hardcore uh, back-end business operations, um, which was very informative. And then the second panel was based around um, equity initiatives, uh, what, what the community not only uh, can do to help support the cannabis uh, businesses, but also what the businesses more importantly, can do to support the community. So I'll be talking about both those things in this video. Takeaway number one from this cannabis conference that Bolton threw was that 80% of the market in California, 80% of the sales of cannabis in California is actually coming from the black market, actually from illicit sales. So that means that only about 20%, the billions of dollars that are already coming in to California's economy from the cannabis uh, business from cannabis businesses uh, is only makes up 20% of the actual sales that happen uh, throughout California, which means that there's 80% of the market there that can still come on board in terms of the business marketplace and, and increase tax revenue. But most importantly, and this goes to a point that's uh, made later in some of my takeaways and was certainly made by the second round of panelists at this conference, more importantly, what that shows is that there's a large part of the marketplace that isn't being spoken to when, when these businesses start up. And I think we can dive into that a little bit. So, you know, there was a lot of uh, emphasis on what uh, businesses can do to, you know, obviously uh, deal with some of the regulations that are happening, making sure their products are clean from end to end, uh, doing the testing and uh, certifying of uh, the products that they sell and also the ingredients that are included. There was a lot of talk about that. There was a lot of talk about efficiency and making sure that your employee, uh, employee, employees are um, covered in terms of insurance and, and the banking that is coming. Uh, there's a big point about banking that I'll make in one of the later points, one of my later takeaways. But really, uh, all of that is only applying to 20% of the marketplace in California specifically. Uh, and 80% of that marketplace still isn't actively involved in the legal sales of cannabis and everything that goes along with it. Um, so that means there's a lot of growth there that can happen with that uh, market space in California, but the only way that that's going to happen is if you um, deal directly and are very inclusive of that uh, community that's out there that isn't participating in the legal process yet. It's important to understand why, right? Why are they not participating in the illegal process? Or sorry, the legal process. Uh, why are they not being included in the conversation? Is there a way that we can help that uh, and improve upon that process, not only as business owners, but certainly as people who are interested in the space and people who are interested in supporting the efforts of California and other states uh, in pushing uh, for full legalization and pushing for uh, legislation and regulation that helps this entire uh, economy uh, based around cannabis thrive and survive into the future without leaving behind uh, large portions of the population who can also benefit from its growth, um, but most importantly have been advocates of it for a long time before, prior to legalization. Takeaway number two from the cannabis conference that was thrown by Bolton in uh, Oakland, California was the, uh, that the equity for the community needs to be involved when it comes to uh, growing a business and sustaining these businesses in the cannabis space. And there were a lot of panelists on the second round um, uh, later in the afternoon talking about this. There were business owners like, I'm gonna read down a list here just so I make sure I get everybody's uh, name correct. 
certainly Christine De La Rosa, who is the founder of the People's Dispensary, founder and CEO of that very large dispensary looking to expand nationwide, has done a lot of great work, not only in, in creating um, a safe place for LGBTQ uh, community to come in, minority community, but also supporting those communities by dealing with business owners who come from those communities when it comes to the products and services and business that she does with her shop. So she's she's a very smart lady and had a lot of great stuff to say on the panel, um, but has obviously been putting into practice this equity initiative in her business. And then other folks like uh, Lanesse Martin, who comes from the Hood Incubator, uh, incubator out in Oakland, um, doing a lot to raise awareness around uh, making sure that the communities who have been underserved by the laws that have been in place around cannabis for so long are included as uh, the laws change and as the uh, support for the business community around cannabis expands. Uh, one of the things that she pointed out that I think is worth mentioning is, uh, you know, up in Oakland, there's a lot of opportunity for uh, factory spaces and um, you know, expansion of operations when it comes to not only cannabis, but also hemp processing and things like that, large industrial operations. Well, uh, minorities, um, uh, people who have been uh, affected cr uh, criminally um, uh, by cannabis in the past uh, should have opportunities to be a part of that um, process, be a part of that industrial expansion. They should be given jobs. They should be having, have an opportunity to grow with the marketplace. And again, um, one of the, another thing that she pointed out, which I think is very important to remember, is that uh, they, they shouldn't be locked out, even if they haven't been affected, let's say, criminally um, from, you know, like with a record or anything, uh, when it comes to cannabis, they shouldn't be locked out in terms of education as well. There's a lot of uh, community members who know a lot, and uh, most people who have dealt with cannabis for any length of time understand that there are people who get very knowledgeable about how to grow um, the best about strains and terpenes and fertilizer and processing and, and whether it's making the plant itself uh, the best it can be or making oil or making other products out of it. There are people who know a lot about that who haven't necessarily got an MBA, right? Who haven't gone to university in order to learn these things, but they are in fact experts in the field. As the business expands, as the business grows, as it looks to support larger and larger swaths of the population, um, those who can be involved in it at a high level where they can make a living wage, where they can actually, they're not just pushing, you know, pushing boxes and loading trucks and being delivery drivers, they're actually people who are helping uh, develop the industry, should not be locked out only because they don't have a master's degree in botany. They might still, and probably do still, offer an exceptional level of experience and expertise in this particular marketplace, unlike many others, um, and should be allowed to participate at that level um, without a degree uh, requirement. And I think um, I think it's a very uh, accurate um, argument there uh, that Lanessi makes, um, and I think the Hood Incubator really does support. And then of course, let me give a shout out to uh, Claudio Mercado as well, who is the uh, Cannabis Regulatory Commissioner for the City of Oakland, District 5, and also runs Cali Bueno, which is another uh, cannabis brand um, out there and has done a lot to make sure that uh, the Latin community, Latinx community and, and uh, other communities in and around Oakland, uh, minority communities specifically are also served and um, reap some of the benefits and rewards of the business expansion of cannabis, um, that the businesses are giving back to those communities, that schools are benefiting, that um, technology is coming into the classroom, that kids are seeing that entrepreneurs are being um, you know, created out of this business in a, in a smart way, in a sustainable way, and then that uh, actually does trickle back into the community and allow for further uh, progress. And I think there's a lot of, um, there's just a lot of uh, good positive energy around that, and there really was on this panel. I also want to give a shout out to uh, Rashad Johnson, who is uh, from Ease. He works with um, uh, Ease as a delivery service, if you don't know, in California that does um, cannabis delivery but he works with the government specifically and, is, and uh, ties those two things together um, between Ease and the government out there and had a lot of great things to say when it comes to developing incubator programs for younger entrepreneurs, for inner city uh, youth, for youth in general really to see that this, there are ways to be involved in this market space um, that are legit, that are legal and that are sustainable, but that also again are inclusive 
of where you come from, your background, and uh, and you know the, the environment that uh, you're brought up in, uh, that you can still participate in this business as it moves forward. And we leave a lot of open doors that allow for that type of participation, not just you know white male investors coming in eating up the space and deciding where the market goes in the future. That certainly does not represent uh, the majority of people who have been supporting and advocating for, uh, you know, the responsible use of cannabis for ages. Um, and those people should be included. Takeaway number three from the Bolton Cannabis Summit out in Oakland is uh, that banking will be solved in two years. And this quote comes from uh, Dante Tosetti, who is a uh, consultant in the uh, banking industry um, or the cannabis industry. So he's working with them to help overcome some of their banking challenges. And as many of you know who are in the space, uh, there are significant challenges. Now, I just actually came from, uh, earlier this week, I came from a Boca conference, which is the business owners of Hemp and Cannabis Association out in um, Connecticut. And... They uh, had a presentation, a quick presentation by the folks at Chase Banking who came in and said that they were working with CBD businesses, uh, non-cannabis uh, plant touching businesses. Um, they were also working with some hemp businesses, although there was some, a little bit more details there that needed to be sussed out in terms of what your particular business does. But uh, they were very open to the CBD market. So. There are banks coming on board. This was the first time that I, there were actually two banks represented there. Uh, one was a smaller local bank, um, but there are more banks coming on board um, into this market space and looking to support it. Uh, there's still a lot of challenges, a lot of hurdles um, that we need to overcome and a lot more education that needs to happen in the space. In fact, what Dante points out, even though he thinks banking is going to be solved uh, by at this point, 2021, right? And we'll see if we can hold him to that. But uh there are still a lot of, um, there's a lot of space where education needs to be uh, come into play with the, those who are in the banking process, because that's really the biggest gap is that they don't know really what it is that your business does. They don't know what they're getting involved in and they don't know um, how extensive or how plant touching or how non-plant touching or how, um, uh, how much testing is going into your product. Uh, you know, all these things come into play and uh, what insurance that you have. I mean, all this stuff comes into play when they decide to do business with you. And uh, a lot of banks right now um, are not touching it. They're choosing to wait until, you know, something happens maybe federally across the board that allows them to come into that space. Um, but until that happens, that leaves a lot of businesses sort of in the black, I mean, out, out in the dark, right? You have to run a cash only business. You have to, you know, do uh, digital transactions. You can't take a credit card. You can't do have a POS, uh, you know, for credit card processing. And that becomes very uh, challenging. You have to put the cash in so that your cash is available um, in order to get credit from that. I mean, it becomes very challenging. I've heard a lot of headaches from a lot of business owners. Apparently we're moving in uh, a better direction, but I think it's still state by state. It's even sort of local municipalities. <laughs> Uh, by municipality, and uh, we need to overcome that. And I think a lot of that is going to come from education. So we need more forums. We need more outlets where business owners, um, local communities, and the banking uh, communities can come together and have these conversations around what the needs are from the business communities, what the what the hopes are from the people who are working in the space, and what the uh, banking institutions are ready to allow for. So this brings me to number four in my takeaway from the Bolton Cannabis Summit out in Oakland. Uh, regarding bringing people together and having the advocacy around uh, cannabis and cannabis businesses and, and supporting communities and institutions that support the communities and the businesses, uh, really a large advocacy and the way that this industry is going to survive is through advocacy, through people coming together, standing up for each their business and the businesses around them because as one voice we're going to be able to overcome some of these challenges and really educate others in the space who can support support this movement going forward uh, what became very clear to me and I think Rashad Johnson pointed this out again um, on the on the panel later in the day 
was that uh, waiting around for, you know, institutions, uh, the federal government to put into place laws that are going to support everybody and allow this thing to move forward, um, legalization and even, uh, you know, business opportunities uh, to move forward is not, it's not going to happen fast enough for those who are already in the game right now. And if we leave it up to somebody else who is not nearly as educated in terms of how these businesses operate, the lives that they actually affect and the communities that they actually support, um, decisions are going to be made and, you know, laws are going to be laid down that are not going to actually benefit everybody. So it's important that everybody comes together, the communities, uh, the people who are helped by these businesses and the business leaders and the businesses uh, themselves come into play and have a conversation and continue to open up those opportunities. So I was very grateful to come out uh, to Oakland where Bolton was having that conversation. They were leading by example and saying, yeah, we, we of course want to do business with these businesses, but, but we believe that the conversation um, should be much broader than just how we can, you know, ensure your business. Uh, and so they allowed for that. And I think that's a, that's a great example that other, um, institutions, other organizations, and other businesses can take away is, is host the ability to have these conversations, host an opportunity to uh, bring other people into the conversation um, because a rising tide lifts all boats, right? So we're going to be able to educate more and more and see better, uh, more appropriate actions taken that benefit the majority of people rather than the minority um, who are looking to take financial advantage of this space in this moment of momentum. Uh, if we come together and we ensure that uh, the voice is being heard uh, collectively and consistently. And finally, takeaway number five from the Bolton Cannabis Summit in Oakland, California is be your own advocate. And this comes on the heels of, you know, a lot of the uh, fear around the vaping pens right now. Um, there's a lot of regulation happening, you know, immediately. Uh, in states and also potentially at the federal level of what's going on with these e-cigarettes and vape pens and the oils and juices and all the stuff that goes into them. Um, and yet there's not a lot of education as to what, who we're really talking about, who are the bad actors, what are the ingredients that we're really talking about, because obviously there are companies that are having no problems with this, and then there are companies that are having enormous problems with this and are not regulated, are, do not care, and are not um, focused on the consumer, they're just focusing on making a product that they can mass produce and make a bunch of money very quickly. Um, and it's causing detrimental problems. And we need to be aware of that, we need to take action, but it needs to be uh, balanced with uh, companies who are out there doing good. Uh, this point, of course, was brought up in, in the summit uh, out in Oakland, and uh, one of the uh, panel attendees of the first panel in the morning um, a guy by the name of Wesley Hine, who is a legal and compliance consultant with uh, Mammoth Distribution, um, which of course is a mammoth uh, distri cannabis distribution company. Um, he said that uh, Mammoth had reached out early on. Uh, I mean, we're talking probably a year or two ago um, to news outlets to get them to run stories and address the issue of uh, the chemicals going into some of these vape pens. Not all, of course, certainly, but that some were not, um, not clean, really. They weren't, they weren't putting in clean product, and instead they were putting in a bunch of fillers, vitamin E, other things that, that cause, um, you know, cause you to sell more product, but they're just cutting it, essentially. Um, this is obviously a problem. He said that this needs to be looked into and stories need to be investigated in order to bring this to the public's attention and that news outlets on the whole pretty much ignored him um, or ignored the company. I'm not sure who exactly was reaching out, but they ignored those, uh, those calls, you know, the warning that they were giving and look where we are now. Now it's become um, kind of an epidemic that we're trying to address um, without a lot of education. And my takeaway from that was that uh, Mammoth and others, you know, have no problem creating these stories themselves, right? Our traditional understanding is that you go to a, a news outlet or a media source and get them to lend a voice to whatever the uh, problem is. Instead, you should create the content yourself, create the white paper, create the investigative reporting, create uh, videos about it, educate the public, make blogs, whatever it is, educate 
your audience, certainly, because you want them to be aware of potential problems or certainly information that, that impacts them. But when you educate uh, beyond your audience, you're going to be getting some traction there as well. You're going to be lending that service to the public broadly. And then you actually have something. You have some content. You have some, you've done the work, and you can actually hand that off to a media outlet to just amplify that message. Now the benefit is you're, you're doing the public service. You're, you're getting good information, accurate information um, out to the public around something that your business is based on. And then of course, you get to be the voice of that information. You get to become potentially an authority in that space when it comes to that issue. Uh, and certainly if you're early to the conversation, then you become one of the first that's out there to have that conversation now. So now when the spotlight comes to learning more about it, you start to become one of the um, primary uh, proponents of uh, you know, clean product, um, knowing what's going into it for regulation, you know, all these great things that uphold the values of you and your business, but also are good things for the uh, entire cannabis economy as a whole. Um, I think that that's really the, the route we should go now because the point of the matter is that uh, media outlets these days, the turnaround on stories needs to be so quick that they're not going to have, if there's too much work involved, they're not going to take it, right? They're not going to pick it up and they're not going to lead with it. Um, you need to make the work as easy as possible. Uh, you need to make the yes as easy as possible if that's in fact where you want the information to go. You don't have to have an information go out to a press outlet in order to get a large audience certainly don't. You can create it yourself and that audience will come in because you're creating something that's of value to the community that you're looking to serve. But if you want a press outlet to pick it up, packaging it in a way that makes it easy for them to take that and amplify it um, is a lot better than asking them to do the legwork and create it themselves. So that's my big takeaway on number five. Uh, last one, the Bolton Cannabis Summit in Oakland, California. I can't wait to go back. They're going to do one in Los Angeles, I think, in 2020. So I'm definitely going to come back for that. I think they're doing a great thing. And uh, yeah, I'll tell you more takeaways when I go to more summits um, in the coming year. And uh, I hope you stick around. All right. Thanks for watching.